Isn't it amazing how much the definition of the term smart device has changed? In just the last decade, the idea of what a device is and what it can do has evolved greatly. And now, machine learning is changing all of that. No longer is the cloud required or extra hardware or an additional gateway needed to make our devices smart. But how we implement machine learning into our smart devices, whether they are consumer applications or IIoT designs, can be a big hurdle to overcome. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. No longer is machine learning a niche application for electronic engineering. Machine learning is leading a transformative revolution in a variety of electronic designs. But implementing machine learning can be a tricky task to complete. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Louis Gobin from ST Microelectronics and I investigate how ST Microelectronics is helping embedded developers design edge AI solutions. We take a closer look at the benefits of ST Microelectronics Nano Edge AI Studio and STM32 Cube AI solutions, and how you can take advantage of them in your next design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from ST Microelectronics. Hi, Louis. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Amelia. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so we're talking about IoT data analysis at the edge today. But Lewis, this all boils down to the enablement of more and more smart devices, right? So, trick question, because what do you mean by smart in smart devices? And that's really what we want to focus and clarify a little bit today, and we'll dive into the details but it's just having devices that are more autonomous at the end of the day and how to make that more affordable and democratize that whole idea of having those devices available at the edge. In that case, we mean smart in a different sense than smart was used even five years ago. We don't just mean smart as connected. They can also be connected, but they don't need to be connected. Smart in that case implies autonomy, in its ability to infer or even to learn at the edge, so on the microcontroller, without a gateway, without a cloud, without a connection to anything else, without additional hardware even. That's where we put the smart in that, uh, I guess, new generation of smart products. That makes sense. Now, Lewis, with all of these new smart devices, we're also looking at a whole lot more data being processed at the edge, right? Absolutely. And that's both a cause and a consequence. It's kind of a chicken and the egg problem we're having. We are now collecting so much more data every second that we were, once again, even five, 10 years ago. And the cost associated with collecting that data, sending it and doing the analysis beyond the sensor, even on your local computer cluster, for example, is prohibitive. And that's really where that new ability to collect more data is hitting the wall of efficiency and business sense and where there is a need to filter out or understand that data at the edge where it is collected. And that's where those smart devices come in for that massive amount of data to be able to be handled. And you can still send data out to a centralized server location, and you can decide to send the raw data or process data. But now you can send only the interesting part of the data, the actual events, for example. And you go from sending 100% of your data, or if you have a threshold, let's say 50% of your data, to sending 0.1 or 0.2% of your data for a whole always-on solution. So, Lewis, what does ST Microelectronics offer to help embedded developers design in edge AI solutions? ST does hardware. That's kind of what we're known for. But traditionally, ST actually has a pretty strong or tries to have a pretty strong ecosystem of how to empower that hardware. And that has not started with machine learning. It's historical at ST. And that trend has continued with machine learning is even more stronger because machine learning is so not only new and that also comes into it, but also has so much variables in it. And holding machine learning to the edge, to the microcontroller or even to the sensor is so specific and requires so much work. And there is no real infrastructure in place right now that's 
accepted universally. So we kind of build that up. And that comes out with Nano AGI Studio, which will help anyone from the engineer that has a real need for machine learning for their next product to the data science teams that just need to be more efficient in outputting algorithms for microcontrollers to QBI, which in that case is more linked specifically to those data science team where they will be able to take a model that they've already created, already trained and implement it on the microcontroller. The idea is that we know our microcontrollers, we quite genuinely make them. And we have that unique position where there is a demand and a need for those product, for those edge devices to be empowered by AI and no real solution to port those machine learning platforms that are generally cloud-centric or at very least uh, GPU-centric to the microcontroller. And so that's where those products are slotting. QBI is really just a step from whichever platform anyone else uh, want to use down to the microcontroller. And Nano AGI kind of builds its own algorithm, highly optimized for microcontrollers. So a little bit more restricted on what use case you can do, but a tiny footprint that are in kilobytes of both RAM and flash for truly democratize use of machine learning and the ability to implement that on anything from an STM32 running an M0 all the way to M7s. Okay, so Lewis, can you walk me through the workflow a little bit? What steps are we talking about here? Yeah, so this, for anyone who's done machine learning, will look overly simplified, and it is. I'm not going to pretend that this is the full pipeline with all the going back to previous steps that we all know and love in, in machine learning or in any data science or even engineering projects. But this is the simplified version of what we're talking about. We go from data acquisition to data preparation and data processing, the model selection and training, validation of that model, and finally, the library creation, which includes the implementation part on your target platform, to finally the model inference. So that's the very high level view of what's happening. If we look at where those ST product slots in, so Nano AGI Studio and Cube.ai, they slide in as two different and parallel pipelines. It's not one then the other. These are created to address two different needs by two different types of users or for different use cases. In any case, for any project that wants to run a machine learning or an AI solution, the first question should be, do we really need to run machine learning or AI? And here, I'm maybe shooting myself in the foot, but Machine learning will add complexity to your project. And if you have an alternative solution that does not require machine learning, you should explore that solution first. That being said, if you go into those projects, you want your know-how around the, the solution, around the environment it's going to be in, to be as deep as possible. It's like with any other engineering project, it's not going to be magical, sadly. And you want your data acquisition and the understanding of the use case to be as strong as possible. Nano AGI Studio will help you in that data acquisition. So inside Nano AGI Studio, we have a sub-platform that lets you create data collection for your targeted STM32 with your targeted sensors, for example. You can obviously import data in any way you, you find the most comfortable, but this is here to empower you. If you follow the QBI workflow, that first step of data acquisition data processing is all up to you. We're never going to know anything about it. Second step. In data science, this is where Nano AGI Studio really shines. We're going to take the data you've imported and we're going to create the model from scratch. And by we, I mean Nano AGI Studio, the software solution that would run locally on your machine. And that will not only select the best model for your use case, but also take into account your limitations. So that is going to be how much RAM, how much flash you want to allocate. That is going to be what platform you want to deploy on. And then it's going to give you back as much feedback as possible, as much metrics as relevant and as possible for your model on the performance that have been obtained. QBI starts at that point. With QBI, you need to already have created a model on your favorite platform. It can be TensorFlow, it can be Keras, it can be PyTorch, and so on and so forth. Anything ONNX compatible as well, you can build a model and put it into QBI. That means that you have built, trained that model, and QBI will only handle, only being a big word here, the porting to your target STM32. QBI can handle quantized model, if you're interested. We can also handle the quantization of the model inside QBI, if you're interested in exploring that. Now, 
with NanoJS Studio, all those steps are kind of skipped because we are dedicated this platform to developing solutions for microcontrollers. You do not have to then compile down or translate whichever algorithm you created to the microcontroller. This is what you get out of the box. So at the end, both with NanoAGI and QBI, you get a model ready to be deployed on your microcontroller. And that's the whole goal of this tool. The whole goal of this ecosystem by ST is to let you deploy on any microcontroller or on the most appropriate microcontroller for your project, your machine learning solutions. Great. Now, Lewis, can you explain a bit more about Cube AI? How can ST help me here? So Cube AI has two forms. One is on your local machine. So STM32 Cube AI is an extension of the Cube environment by ST. And the other one is we have the exact same platform, but available online through a web page. So the idea behind Cube AI is not only to let you translate the model, but also to understand how that works in our customer's team. And that usually means that they have engineers or data scientists that are dedicated to the creation of those models that are not experts or they have expertise in, but they are not dedicated to the world of the microcontroller. And that's where QBI Developer Cloud, so that online platform which embeds QBI, comes in. You have the exact same pipeline, the exact same workflow, you have the exact same tools behind it. But with the online platform, you don't need to install anything before using it. You just log into the portal. It's free. You just need a ST account. And from that point, you can import your model and then select your target. And you have a few options that we can cover afterwards. But you simply compile your model for your targeted STM32. And we give you back C code of that model. You have two options or two new features that are available on the online platform compared to a traditional one is the model zoo. So you can have access to it either through the online platform to import a model to test on, or you can have access to the GitHub page from which you can download the model and even modify it for your own use case. So that model zoo by ST is we try to make it representative of the usage of uh, neural networks, so mostly vision, natural language processing, human activity recognition, for example, that we've seen. And we've taken models from the literature and uh, just put them as is, as references. We also have modified models. So we took a model and then we quantized it. So we modified the model just enough to have it still perform well on the task we wanted to perform on, but also be highly optimized and take so much less space and RAM and maybe have a better inference time on your targeted STM32. And so the whole model zoo is both here as possibly a starting point for any project you have, but also it's here as a guide. We are showing our steps in this is how we modify that model. This is why we did it. Or this is a model that's available that has been pre-trained either from the literature from uh, ST's own resources. And you can use transfer learning, for example, so that you don't have to retrain a model from scratch and just adapt it to your use case. So this is really not just here for inspiration, but actually here to get work started. Second feature that's available on the online portal is the board farm. In this case, it's really targeted to make the bridge between the development team of the machine learning algorithms and the embedded developers. We wanted those machine learning engineers to be able to test and have relevant feedback on how their model would perform on the targeted platform and know what modification they did need or did not need to do. For example, are the RAM and flash within parameters? That's pretty straightforward to check for. But also, what is the inference time on this board? And if the inference time is too high, what does inference time look like layer by layer in your model? And that's where the board farm really comes in. We have tried, like everyone else, emulations, and we've concluded that, especially for machine learning, having the actual hardware available for anyone to upload the model and then flash it on a board to get feedback on the inference time and on how the memory is being used, for example, is irreplaceable. So we've set up board farms in Europe, and I believe we're setting one up also in the US right now, so that anyone, once again, with the free account, goes to the portal, they have uploaded their model, and they can, from that point, decide to flash it on one of our farms, one of the board in the board farm. We have a selection of the most used boards for machine learning models, and we're adding new boards regularly so that people can see what difference there is in the very real world of, for example, in vision, inference time. 
that's kind of the critical point. Is it low enough that it fits our project? Do we need it to be real time? Do we need it to be six frames per second, three frames per second? Anything at a frame a second is fine. And that will lead you to different boards with also different costs, but simply different features associated with them as well. So this is where the board farm kicks in as a really powerful tool for the engineers to be able to talk to each other and to be able to have as much information as fast as possible. Excellent. So, Lewis, can we dive a little deeper into this solution? Absolutely. So, QBI has three main focus. The graph optimization, the quantized model support, and the memory optimizer. All of this is so that it is straightforward, simple, and predictable how you're going to be able to implement your next model and your next project on an STM32 microcontroller. So to do that, we have the graph optimization. This will happen for any model you import in QBI, either in the website version or on your local computer version. Here, we are not going to modify the logic of your algorithm, of your neural network, if that's what you're using. We are just going to optimize it for your targeted platform. So that can be very simply translating the operators that you're using to the one that we wrote up for your targeted STM32. It can be slightly rewriting how the layers are computed. So instead of having two separate layers, we might decide that merging some of them, at least for the calculation to optimize the both use of memory and compute cycles is better. And we have a few of those steps that are lined up that will once again, not modify the logic or the weights inside your model, but will heavily optimize your model for the targeted STM32. That will happen to any model you upload. Next is our optional step. So quantize model support. That means two things for cube.ai. One is we can quantize the model for you, bit of a brute force approach, but there's also the part where those dedicated machine learning teams can shine is if you quantize your model yourself, for example, using QCARES, we will handle that quantization and we will handle mixed precision, we'll handle layers that have been quantized or not quantized differently so that you can really optimize layer by layer your model, both for memory footprints as well as inference time, but also keep as high a performance as possible. This is really the part where we keep on working and we keep on digging. That quantized model support, we think, is the key to those next generations and that democratization of those neural networks to the microcontrollers. And the more resources we have available for people to play with or implement the model with, the more we believe these will become a default solution. The last pillar really is around memory optimization. So this is linked to the graph optimizer, but I will mention that we give you feedback on how the memory is allocated. So what kind of footprint each layer has, but also how that memory is allocated by layer and in memory segments, in memory partitions. And that can be extremely powerful if your model is not fitting on your platform right now, because you will get to see what is the layer that uses 20, 30% of that total RAM. And you can decide to either leave it as is and try to optimize everything else, or you can try to quantize just that layer. That gives you a map. It's not going to do anything automatically or magically, but the memory optimizer, and we have the same thing for latency, will give you a very strong map on where to go next for your project to be successful. Okay, so Lewis, do you have any examples of designs or use cases that you could share? So on the current slide that you're seeing on the anomaly detection use cases, this is going to be focused around predictive maintenance is a big one. And I know it's a word we've all heard from for years now, but we see the other side of the picture on not just the hype or that one-time product. We see when our customers are starting to have this as a default or something that is not only interesting, but actually necessary now. And so this is where anomaly detection can come in. This is one class of algorithm available in NanoHS Studio. And standard anomaly detection, you fit in a signal and it will spit back out how nominal or how like the nominal states it looks. And the further away that value is, the more worried you should be. That's a very short answer. The real interest around anomaly detection right here is that with ST's technology, You can actually learn on the device you deploy on. So once again, no cloud, no gateway, no additional hardware anywhere. You can actually train or select a model on your computer 
deploy it on your microcontrollers, put them in the field, and then learn after they've been deployed. And that, once again, gets really powerful because no matter what we do in the lab, we will not account for all the states in which our machines are going to be deployed. And with machine learning, it's really important because we learn from the data we've been fed. And if that data is collected in NAB or even in the field, there will always be something outside of our expectations. And that's where that ability to learn on the microcontroller, either continuously or just one-offs, is really, really powerful. And like that, you can have, especially in the industrial space, you have machines that have been running for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and you can still monitor them. You can just add this as a new device. You have created your algorithm on the new version of that machine, and yet your microcontroller will adapt to that older version. Same machine, but we all know that parts get replaced and things just modify slightly or they just age simply. They wear off a little bit, and that will modify the profile of what you're monitoring, be it through vibrations, currents, any sensor. All our solutions are sensor agnostic, so any sensor or combination of sensor, that signal will look different as it age, and you can adapt to that with learning on the microcontroller. And that is without having to send large amount of data back to the cloud. That's anomaly detection. Second, we have the N-class classification. This standard classification type of algorithms uh, available in Nano HAI, you fit in data, you define your classes that you want the algorithm to be able to predict to, and then you deploy your algorithm, and this one is static. This one will not change through time. It's always be the same. So it's a trade-off between this one, for example, and anomaly detection. Well, anomaly detection brings a flexibility. This one is going to bring the ability to label what's happening specifically. You can have two, three, four, five classes if you want, and that will give you detailed information of what's happening. Upside is you can have both. You can have your cake and eat it. You can use anomaly detection as kind of the alt ways on algorithm that will filter out all the nominal events. Then once an anomaly pops up, feed that anomaly to your classification algorithm and have that classification algorithm be able to tell you this is anomaly X, Y, or Z. Why not just have the classification algorithm is because with this process, you only have to differentiate for the signals coming in between the anomalous classes. You don't have to handle all the possible nominal states of the machine, all the possible nominal environments you're going to be deployed in. Breaking down that problem is two, makes it overall a much, much simpler problem to solve. So smaller footprints, as well as more reliable algorithms. Last algorithm I'm going to mention, the extrapolations. Sorry, I'm part of marketing and we got there before engineers got their hands on it. So this is basically regressions. It's called extrapolations, but now you need to not predict a class. You want to predict a continuous value. So an example for that use case would be if you have a washing machine and you want to understand what load there is in it without having a dedicated sensor. ST has a demo around this. We wanted to see if it was actually possible and we built it. So if you load your laundry in it, we will use the current going to the motor control of the drum of the machine and we'll be able to tell you how much weight you've put in it without a dedicated sensor running on the motor control without taking too much time or too much space away from that motor control solution. This is really the power of having small, efficient algorithms at the edge, being able to do those predictions. In the case of that class of algorithm, extrapolation, it's also static by classification, so it's trained before deployment, and then it will be static through its lifetime on your device. Generally, we have a strong buy-in from industrial customers because these are straightforward solutions. There is a very clear monitoring and understanding your device to not losing money or making money link that is easy to demonstrate. We're, however, seeing a very strong need for machine learning. A couple of years ago, it was more of a fad, honestly. It was more of an interest in having the ability to say, hey, I have a smart device or I have AI in this device. Now the features actually get to be mature and we can have those solutions, not only industrial and predictive maintenance, but also in the smart office space, in the smart city space, in the wearable human activity recognition space. These have existed for a while, but now we're trying to make it not just accessible to the larger and uh, more data intensive companies, but to every company that would need or would want to develop a product in that space. So I think the main takeaway from this is that whatever sensor you're using, whatever product you have, 
machine learning should not be your first stop. But if you have a feature that you're not able to implement right now, or you have a problem that somehow needs fixing, machine learning is a very strong tool in your toolbox. It's just one more tool available to you to solve those problems. And that can be from predictive maintenance that you see on screen right now to, for example, for the people flow counting. In that case, we use an infrared camera. So that both preserve anonymity and also lets you count the flow of people in a defined space going through uh, one way, the other, both ways at the same time. And this was made in collaboration by Schneider Electric uh, using QBI in that case. We have many solutions available, but I think that Nano Edge Studio and QBI really let you develop a machine learning algorithm that can be implemented on STM32s and not with the need of a high-end accelerator, not with the need of a dedicated micro, but on top of your existing stack with your existing products. Okay, so Lewis, what do you think the future looks like for these kind of devices? I think the future looks a lot like today, actually, just with less breakage and less downtime, both in industry, but also in our lives. We will have devices that will be able to tell us not only, hey, now I'm broken and this is what is broken, which is already very useful information, but they will tell you, I am deviating from the norm on this specific problem. So for example, it can be the compressor on your fridge, letting you know that actually maybe there's gas leak, maybe I'm just aging, but I'm not performing as well as I should and I've lost efficiency. All the way to, I'm actually not going to be cooling down your fridge enough anymore. I need to get looked at. And that's giving you a heads up not only hours or days in advance, but weeks in advance. That actually gives you time to organize yourself. And this is an everyday example, but this extrapolates to our everyday activity, our offices, as well as the industry, and especially production lines where downtime for one part of the process means downtime for everything. So we're going to have embedded devices that better understand or are able to understand what they're monitoring. And so that translates to human safety, security, efficiency, and generally longevity of our products. We're trying at ST to let and better develop those solutions and have those available, not as a one packet that can cover everything. We don't think that's the approach. I've never seen an engineering problem be solved by the magical solution, but giving them the tools to develop the solution specific to their problem. And that comes with the complete ecosystem available at st.com. This is where, where we think things are going, how we think we would enable them. After, Edge AI is not in competition, I think, with the cloud, for example. This is an additional tool to optimize the whole process. Instead of setting gigs of data, you're going to send a couple of kilobytes of data for the exact same application, and you'll only send the relevant one. So that cuts on cost, that improves efficiency. And that also lets you have devices that if they don't have a connection or if they lose connection for whatever reason, are still able to function, are still able to signal either through alternative pathways or simply with a light blinking on your machine, what's happening. And that gives a lot of redundancy with the exact same power of prediction and predictive analytics. Excellent. Well, Lewis, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Emilia, for having me. It was a pleasure. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from ST Microelectronics. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the front page of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.